On a dark winter morning, the morbid discovery of a body. The killing so gruesome it shocks even the hardened investigators called to the scene. Someone had tried to slit his throat, almost to the point of, uh, of, of being beheaded. A 48-year-old father of five knifed to death. His bloody remains ditched in a parking lot. Why a body might be dumped there, it was a desolate place. The victim is described by those who knew him as a gentleman who had fled his war-torn country for a peaceful life in Canada. He talked about how safe he felt with his family here. And with the monster who murdered him still on the loose, the community is shaken to its core. We were all afraid. Who is this person? What's happening? Can investigators bring the bloodthirsty killer to justice? It's just like chipping away at a mountain, like piece by piece by piece. of December 30th, 1999, as Canada's largest city readies itself for the new millennium. A man lies dead in the middle of a West Toronto parking lot. And unsuspecting factory employees report for work. And they drove around to the back of this address to park, and as they entered the parking lot, there was a body there. Emergency, please fire ambulance. I just came to 37 Iron Street, and there's a snake guy lying on the ground, bleeding or... Okay, so he's lying in the, at the back. In a pool of blood. In a pool of blood? Yes. His thumb is like, oh my God, it's gross. It's like uh, torn off. Okay, did you see where he was bleeding from besides the thumb? Oh, his head is chopped off. Oh, f His head is chopped off? His cut, his head is sliced. His head is sliced. Okay. Holy f Okay, sir, we're on the way. We're going to be there very shortly. Lead investigator Corey Bacchus and partner Craig Sanson head immediately to the location. The initial information was very brief. All we knew is that we had a male that was deceased who had um, suffered a horrible death. You could see the blood pooling on the parking lot. I could see uh, cut wounds to his body around the uh, neck and the hands. The graphic evidence of a savage assault. The thumb was almost completely severed, which was later classified as a defensive wound by the pathologist. Investigators quickly call forensics officers to the scene, including Sergeant Tom Greer. He had multiple stab wounds, multiple cut marks on his body. But it is the deliberate and horrifying mutilation that takes them aback. I had never seen an attack that was that violent. Uh, he had uh, horizontal slash wounds on his neck, both on the front and, and the back, almost to the point of uh, being beheaded. And the grisly scene holds another important clue. There wasn't a lot of blood on the uh, parking lot, consistent with a large struggle, so it didn't appear that this was the location of the murder. It appeared that this person had been murdered and then dropped there. Who was this victim? Where was he killed? And by whom? Interviews with local workers provide police with a lead. A couple gentlemen had seen a cab leaving the area prior to 7 o'clock in the morning. We had no idea whether or not this person was a driver or was a passenger or, or anything about him at the time. Then, a crucial discovery. On the deceased was a cable bill, and that bill had a name and an address. So that was the first piece of information that we had to start working on this case. Bacchus and Sanson head back to the station to regroup. And we, we did some checks on that family name and the address on the police computer system to learn whatever we could. 
The cable bill is in the name of one Muhammadullah Sagani. Just after 4 p.m., eight hours since the discovery of his body, investigators make their way to the victim's West Toronto address. We described the clothing that the person was wearing, and at that time, the woman was able to tell us that that is the clothing that her husband was wearing when he left for work. It was at this point that she broke down uh, immediately. Bacchus and Sanson gather as much information as possible from the victim's widow. We're told that he was a taxi cab driver in Toronto, and he owned his own cab. They learn that the 48-year-old was a hard-working family man who had moved to Canada from Afghanistan in 1990 to provide a better life for his five children. In his home country, Muhammadullah Sagani had been a medical doctor, but he'd had to leave the career he loved behind. Fellow cab driver, Muhammad Kawaji. I always used to see him when he was sitting in a stand on his off times. He always had medical books with him. He was dreaming that he will go back into practice. But taxi dispatcher and friend, Gene McDonald, says Sagani was grateful just to have a job. Although it wasn't the same as he'd done in his homeland, you know, he was content with what he was here. According to Sagani's grieving wife, Nafisa, her husband had started his shift at 6.15 a.m. and was carrying with him an envelope of cash for deposit at the bank. Might the money provide a motive for this taxi driver's horrendous killing? Now the next thing for us was to try to locate that cab. And fast. It's likely going to be a secondary scene, if not the murder scene itself. To get uh, any forensic value from it is very important. On a frigid December morning in Toronto's West End, a middle-aged man is repeatedly stabbed, savagely mutilated, and then dumped in the center of an empty parking lot. It was a very violent attack with an implement that was very, very sharp. Investigators determined that the victim was murdered elsewhere, then transported to the isolated location. They trace a cable bill found in the man's pocket to a nearby neighborhood. We found his wife and his daughter home. Unfortunately, I had to make the notification. The victim's name is Muhammadullah Sagani, a 48-year-old cab driver and father of five. According to his wife, he'd left for his shift early that morning, carrying with him his earnings from the previous day. This could very much be a motive for murder. Investigators have launched a search for the cab and are appealing to the public to help them find it. Police are looking for a back cab, Metro License 2221, and ask anyone with information to call them immediately. Within hours, Every cab driver in the city has heard the news. Oh, it was shocking. It was horrible. He was an honest, hardworking man that wanted to support his family. And taxi dispatcher Gene McDonald can't understand why anyone would want to kill Sagani. If somebody got into a car with that gentleman, and that was their thought, they would find him so friendly that it would be actually hard to take his life. McDonald regularly traveled by cab, and Sagani was often the driver dispatched to pick him up. He was a different breed of taxi driver. Like, he was always happy. He was always well-groomed. His car was always immaculate. He was just a really good taxi driver, and he was a really good person. So who would stab Sagani more than 50 times, nearly behead him, and why? 12 hours after his body was discovered, lead investigator Corey Bacchus gets word of an abandoned taxi. The cab was located in a uh, strip mall close to where the victim lived. It was uh, parked in a regular parking spot. It still had its roof light on indicating that it was available for fares. Without touching the cab, we go up and we look inside and uh, just to see what you can see. It is the scene of a bloodbath. 
there was a, a large uh, amount of blood, both in the front seat and the back seat, and on the outside of the doors. One of the officers on the scene is Detective Kerry Watkins. It appeared as though the attack took place from behind into the side. Samples were taken at the, at the scene, uh, and then the vehicle was taken to our secure facility. First thing we did with this taxi is I brought in a bloodstain pattern analyst. He found cast off, which is blood flowing from a weapon during a strike inside the cab. Throughout the front seat area, they find extensive cuts in the vinyl. That confirmed my belief, you know, we had a violent attack, the knife blade uh, swinging around with the deceased fighting for his life. And bleeding to death. I found some bloody hand impressions on the ceiling of the taxi. Police must now confirm that the blood belongs to Mahamadula Sagani. We'd uh, wet the cotton portion of the swab with uh, distilled water, and it would be transferred onto the cotton. We would air dry it to be submitted to the Center of Forensic Sciences for analysis. Then, using common packing tape, he begins the laborious search for any traces left behind by the killer. Whatever physical items are there, being hairs and fibers, adhere to the tape, and then it's, uh, it's secured and it's available for analysis later. But in this case, it's the proverbial search for the needle in the haystack. The biggest challenge we have, uh, especially with public vehicles like taxis, is they're, they're a smorgasbord of, of forensic evidence. 48-year-old cab driver Mohamedoula Sagani is dead. The former medical doctor had fled his war-torn country of Afghanistan for a safe and peaceful life in Canada. A devout Muslim and devoted father of five, Sagani seemed to have no enemies. So why was his mutilated body dumped in a West Toronto parking lot? and his blood-soaked taxi abandoned in a nearby shopping plaza. We believe that the attack on the deceased happened inside the cab. While forensics officers continue to comb through Sagani's taxi, searching for a trace of the killer, lead investigator Cori Bacchus and her partner interview widow Nafisa Sagani and learn that her husband could be careless with his cash. She told us that the night before the murder, he had been sitting uh, close to his home with his cab parked, and he was counting um, his earnings for the day. And that a um, gentleman came up to the window and looked into the cab and made some comment about the large amount of money. She was upset with him for, first of all, counting his money in that particular area, and for speaking to this man. She considered that was dangerous. Could that man have returned the following day to rob Mohamedoula Sagani? Or was a passenger responsible for his brutal death? Taxi company records show no indication that he'd been dispatched to any address that morning. Had Sagani picked up a fare on the street? It's very important when somebody is flagging you on the street to make your decision whether you want to pick this person or not. These criminals, they know that taxi drivers always carry $100, $200 with them. You know, there's always cash and it's an easy target. But is it too easy an explanation? There was an amount of cash still in the taxi, so if it was a robbery, it was a sloppy robbery, because they didn't take all of the cash. Back at the strip mall, police are trying to determine when the cab appeared in the plaza parking lot and who was driving it. Luckily, uh, we looked up onto the wall of the grocery store, and there was a surveillance camera pointed right at that particular section of the parking lot. But did it capture an image of the person who abandoned Sagani's taxi in the lot? Police seize the camera tapes and take them back to the station. Lead investigator Corey Bacchus. When we first looked at the tape, our, our main focus was finding when that cab came in. But it is a much used tape, and it seems unlikely they'll get anything from it. Then, when we did find the cab, we saw that it was driven in from the front of the mall, and it turned directly into that one parking spot without stopping anywhere else. 
and we could see the dome light inside the cab go on and off, indicating that the door had opened and somebody had gotten out. And then we saw the vehicle that was parked immediately beside the cab. We saw the dome light go on and off in that vehicle. It appears that the driver, the person police believe killed Mohamedoula Sagani, had transferred from the cab to a parked van. And we could see the brake lights come on and that vehicle reverse and speed out of that parking lot. And it was that moment that we knew that we now had a direction in this case. Police are now convinced Sagani had been targeted and brutally dealt with. The autopsy report reveals that not only had he been stabbed in excess of 50 times, his spinal cord was severed and he was nearly decapitated. Who would have wanted to inflict such violence upon a seemingly harmless cab driver and why? As investigators look more closely at the tape, they see another vehicle, a potential witness to the fleeing van. As the van was backing up to leave, another car was entering the lot from the opposite direction and had to break to avoid colliding with this van. We were hoping that we would be able to identify one of the workers coming into one of the stores to see if they could recall being cut off by a van early in the morning because that person may be able to identify the van or the license plate. Investigator's next step is to see when the van arrived in the first place. Once we found that, we could see that somebody actually parked and uh, we could see a shadow walking away from that parked vehicle, a van, to the north. And Mr. Sagani lived just less than a mile north of that location. So we have that occur around 4.50 in the morning. Then we know Mr. Sagani leaves his apartment around 6.15. Now we see the cab that he had been driving appear just prior to 7 o'clock. So we now know there's only a 45 minute window from when he left his house to when he was attacked to when the cab was returned to the Kipling Heights Plaza. A carefully planned and executed murder committed by someone familiar with Sagani's daily routine. If investigators hope to catch this killer, they'll need to be equally as meticulous. It's just like chipping away at a mountain, like piece by piece by piece. 48-year-old family man and cab driver Mohamedoula Sagani is savagely murdered. His body dumped in an empty West Toronto parking lot. His taxi abandoned in a nearby shopping plaza. Although investigators initially think robbery might be the motive, they find cash left in the car, and video surveillance tape shows someone getting out of Sagani's taxi and into what police believe to be a waiting van. That evidence, along with the exceedingly violent nature of the attack, suggests to investigators that Mohamedoula Sagani was targeted. We were pretty confident that this was not a unknown assailant. When the video also reveals a car almost colliding with the fleeing van, police make an appeal to the public. We are looking for the person or persons in the third vehicle that was cut off by the fleeing vehicle. Then, January 1st, 2000, 48 hours after the murder of Mohamedoula Sagani, another taxi driver is murdered, this time in the nearby city of Brampton. Both involved a cab driver. Both involved a uh, stabbing with a, a knife. The killing sent a chill through the network of Toronto taxi drivers. We were all feeling uh, unsafe, you know? Especially after the other cab driver was murdered. We were all afraid. Who is this person? What's happening, you know? Two days later, Mohamedoula Sagani is buried in a solemn ceremony at his West Toronto mosque. And I can remember seeing the line of cabs as far as you could see. It was industry-wide that everybody came together. It was over a thousand probably. And I think the crime was so bad that it affected the whole community as a whole. Oh, 
Lead investigator Corey Bacchus and partner Craig Sanson traveled to Brampton, Ontario to talk to local police about their community's murdered cabbie. The two assailants in that case have now been caught and investigators determined that they were both in jail on a previous offense when Sagani was killed. Therefore, they couldn't have been involved in Mr. Sagani's murder at all. But that doesn't stop angry taxi drivers from descending on Toronto headquarters, demanding that police take their fear and concern seriously. Lead investigator Corey Bacchus is asked to speak to the crowd. And by this time, I knew that we had that video of the van coming and going. So I was pretty confident that we would be able to solve this if we worked hard enough and had help from the community. We believe the suspect would have received injuries during this attack. And the community responds with a steady stream of tips, including a call from someone who'd come across a stolen van in the same vicinity as the murder. And when they looked in the van, they did find a knife with staining on it that appeared to be blood. Could this be the weapon used to kill Muhammadullah Sagani? Investigators eventually speak with the man who stole the van. He claimed that he was at a men's shelter uh, during the time frame that our murder took place. That story was checked by confirming with authorities at that particular shelter and found to be true. After this knife was tested, uh, I don't believe that there was any blood on it. It turned out to, to be uh, paint, not blood. Then on January 7th, more than a week since Mohamedoula Sagani's murder, police get what they hope will be a break in the case. The witness to the fleeing van finally comes forward. She remembers having to break twice for this van as it backed out in front of her as she entered the lot, and she described it as a blue minivan with the double back doors. In order to be certain, investigators take the witness to a mall parking lot chock full of similar vehicles. And we drove up and down the lanes of the mall and asked her to look at all the vehicles and tell us if she recognized the type of vehicle. And she was consistent in her description of the van. Police reenact the blue double-doored minivan leaving the same lot at the same time of the morning. But no make or model is a match for what's seen on the surveillance tape. It seems the witness's testimony has led investigators astray. So now we're back to square one. And we don't have anyone that can supply us information about that van. Meanwhile, forensic specialists glean whatever they can from Mohamedoula Sagani's cab. That's when they find a receipt in his name for a room at a local motel. We found out that um, Mrs. Sagani had been away for about a month um, before the murder. And during that time is, is the date of the hotel bill. So you immediately start to think that perhaps he's, he's having an affair. And of course that becomes uh, important to us because we've got what I would consider a rage murder. So a jealous husband boyfriend or whatever the case may be. Police pay a visit to the motel to interview the staff. No one recalls having seen Sigani or the woman who may have accompanied him. But it's enough to spark police to take a closer look at their victim's day-to-day -day life. We're looking to see who his uh, friends are, what kind of businesses he may have been involved in, and also just his general habits. Well, Mr. Sigani was a quiet, kind of fella, he would stay amongst his family mostly. Another place that he would frequent though, however, was these grocery stores where he uh, would meet with people from the Afghani background. There was three different uh, grocery or butcher shops that the family would use on a regular basis. So we attended those locations and spoke to the people there. One of the stores they visit is the Alhamra Meat Grocer in West Toronto. Butcher Zakrola Walazeda tells Bacchus that he is acquainted with Muhammadullah Sagani. That he didn't know him in a social setting, that he knew him as a customer that came to the butcher shop. Toronto area cabbies are still mourning the death of 48 year old driver Muhammadullah Sagani when another taxi driver is murdered. Although investigators discover there's no connection between the two slayings, the killings have set the community on edge. 
police finally locate the woman who almost collided with the vehicle investigators believe was driven by Sagani's murderer. The witness remembers it as a blue minivan with double back doors. But a police recreation using just such a van shows it isn't a match for the vehicle on the actual surveillance video. In the meantime, forensic investigators searching through Mohamedoula Sagani's cab find evidence of his visit to a local motel. If he did attend with a female, it might be a married female with an angry husband. Though police locate no witnesses to Sagani's motel visit, they decide to take a closer look at his day-to-day -day life, even speaking with local shopkeepers about his habits. When those visits turn up no leads, police ask Nafisa Sagani for access to the couple's bank statements. They're surprised by what they find. Lead investigator Corey Bacchus. Mrs. Sagani had co-signed a loan for a gentleman, and the gentleman worked at the butcher shop. 31-year-old Zakrola Walazeda, the same man who maintained that the Saganis were just customers. The loan was never approved, but Bacchus wonders why Nafisa would have co-signed for her butcher in the first place. It wouldn't be something where I would sign or co-sign um, a loan for somebody that worked at the grocery store that I frequented if I wasn't uh, a friend of that person or didn't have a lot of contact with that person. Police decide to speak with both Nafisa and Zakrola Walazeda. The widow first denies having co-signed the loan, but later admits to doing it so that the butcher could return to the Middle East to see his family. She mentioned that it was uh, Zagrola's mother that was sick in Pakistan, and that was the reason he had to travel there. But Zagrola, in his interview, tells a different story. Our information from, uh, from Zagrola was he was going to see his father who was sick. What's more? They both talked about going on a trip um, to Pakistan, and they gave accounts of being at the airport and seeing the other person so that we knew that they were on the same plane. And uh, we also knew that they returned at the same time. Part of the purpose of the trip for Mrs. Sagani was to go to an engagement party. Police seek out other guests and find one who has a videotape of the celebrations. Police screen it and are intrigued by what they find. Nafisa is seen here in red. Her date for the do? none other than Zakrola Walazeda. It seems that not only is the wife of their victim having an affair with her butcher. It would appear that their relationship existed far before the murder of Mr. Sagani. Despite the video evidence, Nafisa insists there is nothing going on between her and Zakrola. But investigators continue to scrutinize the widow and the man police believe to be her lover. March 2000, three months into the investigation, and with Mohamedoula Sagani's killer still at large, Nafisa tells police her husband's violent death has made her too afraid to remain in the family home. She was scared, and one thing that she had asked us if uh, she could move from the location. But as police will soon discover, Nafisa Sagani's plans are not just to move, but to move on. She appeared to have bought new clothes. She had bought new furniture. She appeared to be um, starting fresh. Curious about Nafisa's sudden and striking transformation, police decide to put a surveillance team on the widow. I believe it was early April. We wanted to conduct some surveillance on uh, Nafisa's activities to see what her day would entail. Where would she go, who would she see, things like that. Two cars are assigned to tail Nafisa. One of them is driven by Detective Carrie Watkins. She left uh, her residence in her vehicle. Uh, they picked her up initially, radioed to me. I picked her up subsequently and uh, followed her to a plaza. So she parked her vehicle, she exited the vehicle, went into the mall. The officer assisting uh, left on foot to follow into the mall. It seems Nafisa Sagani is simply doing a little shopping. Then... We saw her walk out of the north door of the mall, 
and she walked directly to Zekrola's van and got on the front passenger seat. Butcher Zekrola Walizeda, the man for whom Nafisa Sagani had co-signed a loan and her companion on a trip to Pakistan. And for the first time, police see that Walizeda drives a van, despite having told police he owns a small car. We follow them for uh, some distance into a uh, town just north of Toronto. The officers are astounded by what they see. It would appear that uh, Mr. Walizeda and Mrs. Uh, Sagani were going to a hotel um, to be together. It is a defining moment in the investigation. If their relationship was an intimate relationship, that might be a very strong possibility that this is a motive for murder. For investigators on the Muhammadullah Sagani murder, it is an intriguing case of twists and turns. The Toronto cab driver was not the victim of a random killing, but a targeted homicide. And Sagani had secrets in his life, uncovered by lead investigator Corey Bacchus. We know that he did go to a hotel for one night. One of the possibilities would be that um, the gentleman's meeting a female. But the 48-year-old father of five was, by all accounts, a family man who liked nothing more than to be at home and to visit the small stores in his West Toronto neighborhood. Like the Alhambra meat grocer, where butcher Zakrola Walizeda admits to being acquainted with the Saganis. He knew them as, as customers uh, to the store his store, and he'd never been to their home. But the Sagani's bank records indicate that Sagani's wife, Nafisa, had offered to co-sign a loan for Walizeda. Then investigators discover that not only had the butcher and Nafisa traveled to Pakistan on the same plane, they had also attended an engagement celebration together for one of her friends. Now you start adding them together, and you're starting to get a bit of a suspicion of, of these two. When police put a tail on Nafisa Sagani, they see her meet Zakrola Walizeda, get into his minivan, and drive to a local motel. I'm thinking that we've just started a new adventure on this case. That's when the couple suddenly spot the surveillance team. They looked in my direction, the both of them. Uh, they became suspicious and uh, left. At their first opportunity, police speak to the butcher yet again. Zakrola said that he had met with Nafisa in the mall by chance as she was sitting having a coffee, which we knew was not correct, and that she was looked very nervous and that she'd been followed by somebody right from her home. So he was helping her by taking her away from the mall and taking her someplace where they could talk. That is what he told me his motivation was to drive to a motel outside of the city with Mrs. Sagani. Investigators now know that Zakrola owns a van. Although it doesn't match the description of the vehicle reported by the witness in the parking lot, police believe it may nonetheless be a match for the van captured on the surveillance tape. They mount a second recreation, this time using the same make and model owned by the butcher. The results? It was the closest we were going to get to a match. And the closest they'd come to identifying a suspect. We believe that we had the same kind of van being driven from the crime scene. And that exact kind of van is owned by Zed Rola, who we now know was in an affair with Mephisa. That was the first time that we had a potential motive for the murder of Mr. Sagani. Officers seize Zakrola's van in order to look for Mohamedullah Sagani's DNA. Some blood was found uh, on uh, the gas pedal, as well as some small blood drops on the floor of the car. Those were sampled, and they turned out to be animal blood. Not out of the ordinary for a butcher. Police now look for evidence of Zakrola in Sagani's cab. But they'll need a blood sample from Zakrola in order to compare it. He advised that he was actually, I believe, allergic to blood. That was of interest to us, considering that this was a gentleman that dealt with uh, blood and meat on a daily basis. Zakrola eventually agrees to the blood sample, 
but forensics officers don't find any of his DNA in Sagani's cab. With only circumstantial evidence against the butcher, police can't muster a murder charge. Lead investigator Corey Bacchus is running out of options. We have already done surveillance. We have done the search warrant. We have done the DNA testing. We don't have fingerprints. So you go to wiretaps. But wiretaps require approval from a judge, and getting that takes time. It's not until June 2000, six months after Sagani's murder, that investigators finally receive the court's blessing, allowing them to listen to and record the many conversations between Nafisa and the butcher. <laughs> We hear that there is a, a very intimate relationship between um, the two people. Investigators decide it's time to get tough with Nafisa Sagani. This was the first time that we went and confronted her with all the evidence that we had. Nafisa's co-signing a bank loan for the butcher, the couple's trip to Pakistan, the motel visit, and their intimate phone conversations. The interview lasted close to four hours at her kitchen table. She admitted to the relationship being in existence long before the murder. But Nafisa flatly denies having had any involvement in her husband's death. She does, however, provide police with a crucial detail about her lover. After the murder, that she had sex with him and noticed he had small cuts on his chest area. And investigators have a theory about how Wallazeda got them. During the frenzied attack, of the knife being swung and Mr. Sagani fighting back, it is conceivable that Zerola could have been cut by the knife himself. At this point of our investigation, we've made both Mr. Walizeta and Mrs. Sagani aware that we believe that they're suspects in this murder. Seven months after the savage stabbing of cab driver Mohamedula Sagani, his wife Nafisa is feeling the heat. Police tail her to a West Toronto mall where she meets butcher Zakrola Walazeda. Then the two attempt to check into a hotel in a neighboring town. That's when the lovers spot the surveillance team. But police have already taken note of Zakrola's van. Investigators compare it to the van caught on surveillance tape at the parking lot where Sagani's cab was dumped. They get a match. We have a new direction and uh, we have a, a good lead, and now we're gonna start working on that. Officers seize and search Zakrola's van, but find no DNA evidence from Sagani, nor do they find Zakrola's DNA inside the victim's blood-soaked cab. As a last resort, police tap the phone conversations between the widow and her butcher. <laughs> <laughs> then they confront Nafisa, who finally admits to her ongoing relationship with Zakrola Walazeda, but she denies having anything to do with her husband's murder. Then she tells them that uh, Mr. Walazeda um, did not have a cut on his chest before the murder, but that she did see the cut after the murder. But without solid proof of Walazeda's involvement in the gruesome killing, lead investigator Corey Bacchus must continue to look for the evidence she'll need to convict him. And at this point, um, Mrs. Sagani starts to distance herself from Mr. Walazeda, and she starts being involved with other people, other gentlemen. According to Nafisa, the butcher sees her returning from a date and confronts her on her doorstep. He was very, very angry that, he, that she had been seeing another man. 
He said to her words to the effect, I will kill you as I killed your husband. Nafisa's son-in-law is witness to the butcher's threat. Cory Bacchus knows that with his testimony, she can finally lay charges against Zakrola Walazeda. At that point in time, I put things into action to arrest Zakrola Walazeda for the murder of Mr. Sagani. After 10 months of painstaking investigation, police finally have their suspect in custody. He was given his opportunity to speak to his lawyer. Um, he waived all of that, and we had a videotaped conversation with him. And though he's being charged with murder, all Zakrola Walazeda wants to talk about is Nafisa Sagani having dumped him for a new man. You are wife, and you need the sex? Come with me. What? You need the sex? I give you good sex. I'm young, younger than that. Why are you? He admitted to the affair and admitted to the uh, being upset and things like that, but did not give us any further information. As for the knife wounds Nafisa said appeared on her lover's chest after the murder, the butcher has an explanation. Uh, because the meat is coming too heavy, 150, 160 pounds. Sometimes uh, I cut from here, uh, sometimes the knife is coming like this. Little. And even though investigators make it clear they're not buying Wallazeda's story. Um, at no time during that interview did he confess to murdering Mr. Sagani. But the prosecution paints a picture of a jealous butcher who wanted Nafisa Sagani all to himself. That he had meticulously planned her husband's murder, then executed it in a blood-chilling rage. And on January 17, 2003, three years after the murder of Mohamedullah Sagani, a jury finds Zakrola Walazeda guilty of first-degree murder. He is sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. If my assumption is correct that he did this out of love for Nafisa, and now he's sitting in a jail cell, it boggles my mind that he wouldn't uh, tell us the whole story. In 2007, Walazeda sought to overturn his murder conviction, but his appeal was denied. As for the widow, Nafisa. We have no evidence that would support charging Mrs. Sagani with any part of this crime. Uh, to date, there has been no further evidence obtained that would allow us to do so. In 2008, Cory Bacchus was promoted to inspector with the Toronto Police Department. For more information, go to myviva.ca forward slash murder she solved.